The Discovery Channel was once a very dry but very earnest item in the basic cable lineup. In the 80s and 90s, the cable network ran educational shows, but since every other channel decided to get into reality television in the new millennium, Discovery pivoted to a reality-heavy rotation too. And with reality TV, comes scandal. The Mythbusters crew educated as they entertained, informing the masses about how the world really works and debunking widely believed misinformation along the way. The gang also seemed to virtually always find a reason to blow something up. You know, for science. The vast majority of the time, those explosions were conducted in a controlled environment with every precaution considered ahead of time. But with explosions, you really have to get all the boxes checked, or things go sideways. After a Mythbusters-created explosion knocked her off her couch and shattered a window in her house in Esparto, California in 2009, Cheryl Stevens told KCRA-TV, It was a boom that was just... I had never heard anything like that before. It was really weird. Seeing a plume of smoke and dust rise about a mile outside town, locals thought there might have been a plane crash or a building explosion. But it had merely been those pesky busters of myth attempting to see if the phrase knock your socks off had any basis in reality. They'd blown up 500 pounds of ammonium nitrate to remove the socks from a mannequin, but they didn't realize the explosion would be as big as it was. Mythbusters paid for several broken windows in and around Esparto. In 2014, the Discovery Channel announced Eaten Alive, a two-hour special featuring Paul Rosalie, a conservation advocate and snake expert, in his quest to locate a 25-foot-long anaconda he'd seen years before in the Amazon rainforest. While wearing a protective suit covered in pig's blood, he would allow the snake to consume him and then regurgitate him. Why? To raise awareness of the need to save the rainforest, obviously. PETA condemned the televised stunt, arguing that it was cruel to provoke an animal, but the Discovery Channel argued that the snake would ultimately emerge unharmed, as would Rosalie. I, I know a lot about anacondas. I would never hurt one. Despite the concerns, Eaten Alive aired in December 2014. It was ultimately much ado about nothing because Rosalie did not even get eaten alive. Worse, he didn't even find the right snake. After traipsing around the jungle, he had to settle for a 20-foot anaconda. With 10 minutes left in the show, he approached it in the water and successfully provoked it. Its mouth closed around Rosalie's head and started to crush his arm, which is when Rosalie freaked out and called for his crew to shut down the stunt and pull him out of the snake's fatal clutches. In the end, those most angered by Eaten Alive were viewers who expressed their disappointment at not actually getting to see what was advertised in the show's title. For 10 seasons now, armchair survivalists and people who like the idea but not the practice of camping have dutifully followed Alaskan Bush People, the Discovery Channel show about the large and extended Brown family as they try to live way off the grid and not die in the most remote parts of Alaska for months at a time. While the family is ostensibly from Alaska and certainly seem to embody the rugged Alaskan values they espouse on the show, not all of the family members actually live in Alaska all the time, which got them in trouble with the law. No, it's not illegal to stretch the truth on a reality show, but it is illegal to claim tax credits as an Alaskan resident when you don't live there. In 2014, not long after Alaskan Bush People premiered, a grand jury in Juneau issued indictments for members of the Brown family on felony charges of unsworn falsification and theft. Top dog Billy Brown and son Joshua Brown reached a plea deal, accepting fines and 30 days in jail while admitting they had left Alaska in October 2009, stayed gone until August 2012, but still accepted the subsidy that full-time residents receive from state oil money. Airing on the Discovery Channel from 2011 to 2014, Sons of Guns focused on a Louisiana-based company called Red Jacket Firearms, which made and sold customized weaponry to police departments, private security companies, and gun enthusiasts. That kind of business necessarily involves dangerous and explosive equipment, including guns of course, as well as ammunition and pyrotechnics. Sons of Guns also involved a bit of travel as Red Jacket sold to individuals and organizations all over the country. Shortly after the show's first season debuted, two crew members parked a rental truck filled with pyrotechnics and a few firearms outside Terminal B at the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. Then, looking for a third member of their party, they left the truck unattended. Yes, they briefly abandoned a truck loaded with explosives and guns outside an airport. Even worse, they did it on September 11, 2011, the 10th anniversary of the terror attacks of 9-11. Airport security and the FBI located the owners of the truck and grilled them. The crew members were eventually released and the lockdown terminal reopened after a couple hours. 
Besides reality shows, another constant in cable TV programming is alarmist commercials for wallets that claim to block hackers' attempts to steal information from radio frequency identification-enabled or RFID credit cards. It turns out that techno criminals really can do that, and in 2007, Mythbusters hosts Adam Savage and Jamie Hyndman tried to prove it. CNET reports that at the 2008 Last Hacking on Planet Earth conference, Savage claimed that the experiment was scrapped mid-production due to objections from advertisers in the technology and credit card sectors in a conference call with Discovery Channel Brass. Savage described a conference call where Texas Instruments comes on <clears throat> along with Chief Legal Counsel for American Express, Visa, Discover. <laughs> Savage went on to say Discovery was outgunned and told not to air the episode. Texas Instruments spokesperson Cindy Huff told CNET that her company just had some questions for Mythbusters about how they planned to broach the topic and said it was Mythbusters who decided not to pursue the episode. After that, Savage had to retract some of his wording, saying, I have to admit that I got some of my facts wrong. He revealed that he hadn't actually been on the conference call. Nevertheless, Mythbusters did eventually air an episode about RFID, but didn't address the technology's possible security flaws. American Casino, which aired on Discovery in 2004 before moving to sister network The Travel Channel the following year, gave viewers an inside look at the day-to-day -day business and operations that take place behind the scenes in one of the most secure and secretive places in the country, a Nevada gambling resort, namely the Green Valley Ranch Casino and Hotel in suburban Henderson. American Casino didn't rely much on the soap opera-like personal clashes that define most reality TV shows, but it provided for some shocking and tragic off-camera scandal. Michael Tata was featured on the show's first season, going about his job as vice president of hotel operations. In July 2004, while Discovery was in the middle of airing American Casino, Tata died at age 33. A medical examiner later determined the death to be accidental, likely due to a combination of alcohol and fentanyl, an extremely powerful opiate painkiller. American Casino got bumped from Discovery's lineup due to a scheduled hiatus, but producers got back to work making more episodes less than a month after Tata's death. About the worst thing a reality show can do is fake it. It makes viewers feel silly for investing so much time and emotional bandwidth in a series only to find out that it was staged. Discovery Channel's Man vs. Wild featured military-trained British survivalist Bear Grylls as he ventured into the wilderness with little more than his special set of skills. He always made it through, in part because most everything was staged. After the first season of the show aired, a crew member told the Sunday Times that Grills wasn't always sleeping on twigs and leaves, but in a nearby hotel. On another occasion, an episode implied Grills built himself a sturdy raft when in fact a crew had previously built it to see if it would float, then carefully disassembled it so Grills could put it together himself. And those wild horses Grills encountered? They were rented. When confronted with all this, Grills didn't deny it. He apologized. He told the BBC, if people felt misled on how the first series was represented, I'm really sorry for that. Meanwhile, the Discovery Channel owned up to how isolated elements had not been natural to the environment, or, you know, fake. I've been all the way around this now. It's definitely an island. What American Chopper was to motorcycles, American Guns was to firearms. It showcased the goings-on at the Wyatt family's Gunsmoke Guns Shop in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. In December 2012, Discovery Channel canceled American Guns and pulled reruns, too. The network claimed it had decided weeks earlier to not renew the show, but it was only announced after the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. Even if that hadn't happened, Discovery likely would have distanced itself from American Guns soon anyway because a massive scandal broke out. Shortly after a 2013 break-in and robbery, the IRS closed Gunsmoke to perform a search. A month later, an affidavit related to that search was made public. It all goes back to 2010, when the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives received a tip that Gunsmoke, under manager Rich Wyatt, possessed six illegal firearms. That prompted a closer look at Gunsmoke's records, which revealed that the Wyatts didn't actually own the store as their show implied. Wyatt's signature appeared on sales tax returns from 2008 to 2011, but nobody's signature appeared on several other years' worth of tax returns because they weren't filed for a number of years. The government also alleged that the Wyatts underreported their wages to steal from the business, as evidenced by multiple large real estate and car purchases. In 2018, Rich Wyatt got a 78-month prison sentence for the gun dealing and tax charges. You're taking all this money? All this money, yeah. You can't do that. 
Discovery Channel's motorcycle series Monster Garage followed Jesse James and a team of mechanics, fabricators, and artists as they attempted to make extreme modifications to vehicles. For example, they tried to turn a DeLorean into a hovercraft. James came to the series with solid credentials as the owner and main builder of souped-up and custom motorcycles at West Coast Choppers. James also stakes historical and familial claim to his bad boy image. He says he's a distant descendant of Wild West scofflaw Jesse James. It would seem that the 21st century Jesse James broke the law just like his 19th century namesake. The California Air Resources Board levied a fine of more than $270,000 at James and West Coast Choppers, charging man and business with customizing and selling bikes that shattered the Golden State's clean air regulations. An investigation found that his monsters didn't come with state-certified exhaust and fuel system emissions gear and that they generated 10 times the legal limits of hydrocarbons. James and company worked on the bikes in question between the years of 1998 and 2005, overlapping the time Monster Garage was on the air. Early one morning in December 2011, Mythbusters visited a bomb range in Alameda County, California, about 25 miles north of San Jose. They had been there more than 50 times already. This time, they brought along a cannon built especially for the show and tested the trajectory of a softball-sized cannonball. The projectile was intended to blast through a few barrels of water and a wall of cinder blocks, then come to rest somewhere in the protective hills around the bomb range. The cannonball missed the water barrels intended to slow its flight. It soared through the wall and bounced off one of the hills and into the nearby town of Dublin. The cannonball kept going through the door of a house, through the walls of an upstairs bedroom, and through the window of a minivan 100 feet away. That house was occupied by three people at the time, who somehow didn't even wake up. Mythbusters sent a producer to the home and agreed to meet with the family's insurance companies to work everything out. Right. Well, it radically altered our entire safety procedure and our yeah. approach and a mental approach to safety from the ground up. In an era of fake news, it's refreshing to be able to count on the proven facts of Eris past. But while you might put your money on a network whose liberal brand is bringing bygone times to life, let's just say not everything on the History Channel, now known simply as History, is particularly respectable. Ancient Aliens might hold the dubious crown of the History Channel's least historical show. It also made its way onto Southern Poverty Law Center's Hate Watch blog for showcasing white supremacist theories. Is it possible? that the course of human civilization has been determined not by history's most profound thinkers, but by some external force. The idea that ancient African, Asian, and Native American architectural marvels could have only been built by some kind of alien entity isn't a new one. Hate Watch reminds us that this concept was used by Andrew Jackson to justify the Indian Removal Act of 1830 in North America. In fact, much white supremacist literature over the years has suggested that non-European civilizations didn't build any wonders of the past, and that ancient Aryans are somehow secretly responsible. Switch out Aryans for aliens and you can see why people find the show so distasteful. And as Hyperallergic points out, we already know how the pyramids were built. Ramps. When it comes to the curse of Oak Island, there exists a piece of so-called evidence that we know is a fake, the Oak Island map. This particular map looks like it got torn out of a journal someone purchased at the Dollar Tree, but the notes are in French. According to the show, this map is connected to a much more mysterious and valuable Templar document. Zena's map and her research I find incredible. I want to prove that it's authentic. And to that end, I think we've made some strides. But according to Donald Rue, who was once in possession of both of those documents, the two are unrelated. He also says that the Oak Island map is a fabrication created by someone in the 70s. If the show's use of those two pieces of evidence is what amounts to proof, we don't really believe anything else on Oak Island. The fact that Counting Cars star Danny Coker is living a hippie-hating, muscle-car-loving, masculine stereotype isn't surprising. He's a car guy, and he likes combustion engines, loud noises, and high speed. And really, none of those things are compatible with a cleaner environment. Guys, I'm just not feeling this. He told the Canadian Morning Show in 2013, Prius I've got no use for. If it gets four miles to the gallon and has 800 horsepower, I'm thrilled. We've got more oil than we can shake a stick at. The politicians are playing a game. Let's burn this stuff and have a good time. According to the Vegas tourist, Rick Dale from American Restoration was called out in 2012 for restoring a 1950s-style jukebox, but failing to actually repair the thing per the original agreement. Now, it's great to have a sharp-looking jukebox, but what you really want is a sharp-looking jukebox that plays music. 
especially if you pay someone $4,000 to do it. But not only did Dale reportedly fail to acknowledge that the work wasn't complete, he also cashed the check and stopped returning his customers' phone calls. It's not all about the money. It's about making something that you want your memory alive. Sons of Liberty is what American history would look like if the Founding Fathers were all moonlighting as characters on Riverdale. Actual history recalls the Sam Adams of 1765 as a middle-aged dude with a paunch. But in Sons of Liberty, he's hot. And that's not the show's only inaccuracy. The Journal of the American Revolution listed 22 missteps within the first episode alone. This is yet another incident in a long line of treasonable acts committed by a childish and insubordinate colony. Of course, this is historical fiction, and almost every piece of historical fiction ever written contains inaccuracies. It's called creative license. Just don't believe everything you see on history. That that freedom cannot be taken away from us. That, that is our God-given right. In history's defense, Vikings is based on the Old Norse sagas, which National Geographic reports were written down in the 13th century, but were passed down verbally for centuries prior. So the facts recorded in the sagas have likely been embellished, altered, or even completely made up. Historians don't even agree on whether the show's central character, Ragnar Lothbrok, even existed. Who wants to be king? One of the biggest liberties showrunners took was with the relationship between Ragnar and Rolo. In real life, assuming Ragnar existed, the two men were not only not brothers, it's unlikely they ever even met. And the show's timeline is suspect too, as we see our favorite marauders raiding a monastery in Season 1 and then attacking Paris in Season 3, two events that happened 120 years apart, according to Ranker. Also, the Vikings did wear helmets, though not horned ones, Christians didn't crucify heathens, and Vikings almost never fought pitched battles since they preferred raids. Sadly, that doesn't leave a whole lot of room for the truth. If Disneyland is the happiest place on Earth, then Disney movies have got to be the happiest movies on Earth. After all, they're almost always good, wholesome fun. But unfortunately, there's a darker side to Disney that many people don't know. These are the stories that have put Disney in hot water. It probably won't surprise you to hear that the Disney of the mid-20th century wasn't exactly progressive when it came to hiring women. In fact, Disney even had a form letter it used specifically to tell women who were interested in becoming animators that they never hired women to become animators. The letter reads, Women do not do any of the creative work in connection with preparing the cartoons for the screen, as that work is performed entirely by young men. According to Open Culture, the letter was standard protocol back in 1938, just after the release of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Women could apply to become inkers or painters, though, which were the people who colored in the animated frames. Even so, Disney didn't recommend moving to Hollywood since, in their words, there are really very few openings in comparison with the number of girls who apply. To be fair, this was the late 1930s when there weren't many career options for women anywhere, so in those days, this wasn't considered much of a scandal. It wasn't until copies of these letters started cropping up in modern times that everyone realized just how problematic Disney had been. Back in Disney's heyday, the company did some stuff that was pretty blatantly racist. Everyone remembers the crows from Dumbo, which were clearly an African-American stereotype, although you'll hear some people argue that because the crows were helpful, friendly characters, they couldn't possibly have been racist. Never mind that their leader was called Jim Crow, they were jive talkers, and they were portrayed as lazy and kind of stupid. But it actually gets worse, way worse than that. One of Disney's most blatantly racist films was 1946's Song of the South, which was basically a movie about how much fun it was to be a plantation slave because you got to sing and dance around with a bunch of cartoon animals. According to The Guardian, the film is so ugly and racist that Disney even agreed to never show it again. In the US, you can't get it on any officially released DVD, Laserdisc, or VHS. In 2007, there was talk that Disney might reconsider their decision for some reason, but so far you still can't buy Song of the South from Disney, and that's almost definitely a good thing. In the 1999 video release of Disney's The Rescuers, there are two frames that show the image of a topless woman in a window in the background. 
Oddly, the images weren't spotted by some religious group obsessively going through the video frame by frame in the hope of catching Disney's indiscretions. According to Snopes, Disney itself made the announcement after 3.4 million copies of the tape were already in the hands of consumers. The company said the frames were added in 1977 by someone working on the film in post-production. In other words, they were included in the original theatrical release, too. Disney ended up recalling the release, which isn't exactly an inexpensive thing to have to do. In the golden age of cheap crap produced with overseas labor, very few people seem to really care about the working conditions in sweatshop factories. Today, we tend to think of human rights as being sort of important, although people do still really like cheap crap. By 2001, no one really thought it was okay that the conditions in the factories which produced Disney's goods were so deplorable. According to Rabble, Disney was working with not one, but 12 Chinese supply factories, where women regularly worked 16-hour days for ridiculously low wages. But that wasn't the only thing that caused the Makila Solidarity Network to name Disney the Sweatshop Retailer of the Year. It was also the fact that Disney just didn't seem to care. In 2011, Disney factories were in the news again, this time for employing children as young as 14 and forcing workers to do three times as much overtime as permitted by law. Instead of just brushing the whole thing off, though, The Guardian says Disney launched its own investigation, so that's at least an improvement over the previous decade. Really, though, a company that charges $75 for a sweatshirt ought to be able to use some of that money to contract with a factory that doesn't mistreat their workers. Anyone who says money can't buy you happiness has clearly never been to the happiest place on Earth. While average families save for months just to afford the park's regular passes, people who have money were, until very recently, happily shelling out extra cash so they didn't have to wait in line all day. In September 2013, CNN reported that Disney was going to change its disabled visitors policy. Instead of granting disabled guests instant access to rides, Disney now gives disabled visitors a ride ticket with a specific time printed on it so they won't have to wait in line. That means no more instant access, though, so it's sort of a net loss as far as the disabled population is concerned. So why did Disney do this? It's because wealthy visitors were paying disabled people to pretend to be family members so that everyone in their party could skip the line. Yes, besides using wealth and privilege to buy their way into a Disneyland experience that many able-bodied people don't ever get to experience, they also ended up wrecking things for people who genuinely need the extra assistance. If there's one thing money can't buy, it's class. Merida was the first Disney princess who looked like a real girl. You know, rather than a freakishly skinny facsimile of a human female with hair that remains perfect even while scrubbing castle floors. Disney was applauded when Merida became the latest in the long lineup of Disney princesses. Except Disney, while working on new marketing material for Brave, decided they liked things the way they used to be. So they made Merida skinnier and gave her makeup, a bigger bust, and a sparkly low-cut dress with dropped shoulders. But hey, at least her hair was still messy. Merida, you are a princess! I expect you to act like one! According to BuzzFeed, Merida's creator wasn't the only one who was pissed off about the makeover. Fans didn't like it either. In fact, 200,000 people signed a Change.org petition against the redesign, and Disney actually responded to the outrage by pulling the new version of Merida from its website and replacing her with the original. So hey, sometimes outrage works. Generally speaking, it's probably best to just stay away from the water at Disney theme parks, because if Disney is incapable of getting rid of all their nuisance gators, they're not going to stand a chance at getting rid of their nuisance amoebas. According to Yesterland, in 1980, an 11-year-old boy died from a rare brain infection known as primary amoebic meningitis, or PAM for short. Officials determined that he obtained the infection while swimming at Disney's River Country Water Park in Florida. Pam can happen when a swimmer gets warm fresh water up the nose, which in August is pretty much all the fresh water in Florida. And when you're plummeting down a water slide, you're pretty likely to get at least a little water up your nose. Pam is almost universally fatal, so you're pretty much finished once you contract it. After the 1980 incident, officials were quick to say that the amoeba is actually very common, so there's no reason to think that River Country was any more amoeba-infested than every other warm water lake or river. Still, there's a little thing called chlorination that mostly prevents Pam in other water parks. River Country, however, pumped its water from a nearby natural lake, amoebas and all. Despite the scandal, the park actually remained open and continued to operate for another few decades. 
You already know that Disney has a history of using sweatshops to produce their goods. But it isn't just overseas workers who get treated badly. Disney's American workers do too. Disneyland alone has 30,000 employees, which seems like a ridiculous amount of overhead until you realize that the park had roughly 20 million visitors in 2016, most of whom paid around $117 for their ticket. To be fair, there are also operating expenses, but then there's also the part where guests pay $75 for a sweatshirt and $30 for a taco, so tickets aren't exactly the only source of revenue. According to the Los Angeles Times, Disneyland's revenue has risen while employee pay has fallen by about 50 15%. Most Disneyland workers make less than $15 an hour, and some only make $11 an hour. If you think that doesn't sound like enough money to survive in Southern California, you're right. More than 1 in 10 of Disneyland's so-called cast members say they've experienced homelessness. It's the happiest place on Earth, all right, for everyone who gets to leave. In 2017, Disney's chief creative officer John Lasseter announced plans for a six-month leave of absence from the company, not because he needed to recharge his creative batteries or anything, but because he'd just had a bunch of sexual harassment accusations leveled against him. Lasseter called these incidents missteps, but they were way, way more than that. Employees actively avoided him at rap parties because he was known for groping, lewd comments, and drunken carousing. It's Denise Ream, the producer of Cars 2. She hasn't been on camera yet today. <laughs> What's more, Disney knew about his behavior but never took any action against him because his work has grossed them around $13 billion in just over a decade. In 2018, the six-month leave of absence turned into a resignation, and while he was apologetic, it was very much one of those I'm sorry you think I was bad sort of apologies rather than anything genuine. In a memo he wrote to employees just before his leave of absence, he mentioned unwanted hugs and said, No matter how benign my intent, everyone has the right to set their own boundaries and have them respected. Of course, it's probably fair to say that benign isn't the word his co-workers would use. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is arguably the most successful film franchise of all time, so maybe that's why it's so surprising that Marvel has kept things pretty much drama-free for so long. But that doesn't mean the studio's record is totally spotless. Here are a few of the biggest scandals to hit Marvel's movies. Marvel Studios makes some seriously amazing movies, but it's fair to say a lot of them can feel pretty similar. Sure, every so often, a director will put their unique stamp on their film, but for the most part, Marvel Studios has a uniform tone they want to hit with all their films. And if a director sees things differently, they might soon find themselves out of a job. The MCU has been involved in a couple public spats with high-profile directors. Most recently, Ava DuVernay walked away from Black Panther, saying she declined the project because it just wasn't going to be an Ava DuVernay film. Patty Jenkins also had her fair share of issues when it came to dealing with Marvel. She was hired to direct Thor The Dark World, but after just two months, she made the decision to leave the sequel, as Marvel wasn't interested in the story Jenkins wanted to tell. Perhaps the most infamous example of Marvel and a filmmaker clashing heads is the sad story of Edgar Wright. The English auteur had been attached to Ant-Man since 2006, but things just didn't go according to plan. The most diplomatic, you know, answer is that, uh, you know, I wanted to make a Marvel movie, but I don't think they really wanted to make an Edgar Wright movie. After the studio decided to rewrite the script without him, Wright said so long to the MCU in 2014. It was a disappointing departure and proof that no filmmaker can stray too far from the MCU style. For the most part, actors seem to really enjoy working on Marvel projects, but not everyone has enjoyed their time with the Avengers. According to The Hollywood Reporter, Natalie Portman really wanted Patty Jenkins to direct Thor The Dark World, so the actress naturally became quite upset with the studio when they parted ways with the filmmaker. Portman stuck around for the film anyway due to contractual obligations, and she was quickly written out of the franchise with a throwaway line in Thor Ragnarok. Sorry to hear that Jane dumped you. She didn't dump me, you know. I dumped her. This is a mutual dumping. Mickey Rourke found himself frustrated with the studio after Iron Man 2. Rourke wanted to flesh out the character of Ivan Vanko and work to create a more complex character for the film. But according to Rourke, Marvel producers cut almost all of that out, leaving us with a far less interesting version of the role. Of course, the most infamous examples of Marvel arguing with actors is how the studio treated the original Bruce Banner, Edward Norton, and the first Colonel Rhodes, Terrence Howard. While both men are notoriously difficult to work with, 
It seems they were cut from the franchise largely due to financial and creative issues. When Guardians of the Galaxy came out in 2014, you wouldn't have found much Gamora merchandise in stores. And when Avengers Age of Ultron hit theaters, Black Widow merchandise was almost impossible to find. The situation was so bad, in fact, that Mark Ruffalo actually called Marvel out on it. When it came to merch, female superheroes just weren't getting any respect, and it's largely thanks to Isaac Ike Perlmutter. Back in the day, Perlmutter was the CEO of Marvel, and he was in charge of everything — movies, TV shows, and publication. Unfortunately, by all accounts, Perlmutter wasn't the biggest fan of diversity. In fact, he was adamantly against making female merchandise, saying it wouldn't sell. It was so bad that when Shane Black wanted to make Maya Hansen the main villain for Iron Man 3, Marvel Brass said no way, claiming nobody would ever buy her toy. Needless to say, Marvel fans were pretty incensed by Perlmutter's misogyny, but his outdated opinions were bad for the company in more ways than one. These days, the MCU is a largely inclusive place, what with films like Captain Marvel and Black Panther. But things haven't always been so welcoming around Marvel Studios, especially when Perlmutter was in charge. When Don Cheadle replaced Terrence Howard in Iron Man 2, for example, the CEO allegedly said nobody would notice because black people look the same. So it's easy to see why it took so long for Marvel to make a movie led by a black superhero. Fortunately, in 2015, there was a major reorganization inside Marvel, wherein Disney changed Perlmutter's title from CEO to Chairman of Marvel Entertainment. More importantly, while Perlmutter is still in charge of the company's publications and TV shows, producer Kevin Feige has been given full control of Marvel Studios, the filmmaking branch of the company. And when you look at how amazing Phase 3 has been, it's easy to see how Perlmutter was holding the MCU back. In the lead-up to Avengers Age of Ultron, Chris Evans and Jeremy Renner were doing an interview with Digital Spy when the subject of Black Widow came up. In the MCU, Black Widow works alongside multiple male heroes and has close friendships with both Hawkeye and Captain America. She's never romantically involved with either of them, and although some fans like to speculate about relationships between these characters, it's never implied in the movies themselves. But when word got out that Natasha actually was somehow involved with Bruce Banner in the upcoming film, Digital Spy asked Evans and Renner what they thought about Black Widow's relationships with the three aforementioned male characters. She's a slut. <laughs> I was gonna say something along that line. It's a complete horror. Obviously, this did not sit well with the fan base, and after a huge outcry, Evans and Renner published apologies in Entertainment Weekly. While Avengers Age of Ultron has a lot going for it, the movie was a hit with multiple controversies. For example, somebody thought it was a good idea to have Tony Stark make this joke. So if I lift it, I, I then rule Asgard? Yes, of course. I will be reinstituting Prima Nocta. And then there was the Black Widow debacle. During the film, the black-clad hero calls herself a monster after saying she was forcibly sterilized at a school for assassins. This sent shockwaves through the fanbase, as many were furious that Widow would consider herself a monster for not being able to have children. And the outrage was so severe that it allegedly drove director Joss Whedon off Twitter. This wasn't the only incident that gave Whedon headaches. The Marvel brass kept forcing him to alter the notorious scene where Thor goes spelunking for info on the Infinity Stones. Whedon was so frustrated with the changes that he wanted to cut the scene. But Marvel said if he did, that he would also have to lose the scene where the Avengers arrive at Hawkeye's farm. The studio allegedly also wanted him to drop the scenes where the Avengers come under the spell of Scarlet Witch. The back-and-forth drama resulted in a very messy movie. And even though Mark Ruffalo would go on to beg Whedon to stay in the franchise, the director reportedly said he'd never direct a Marvel movie again. Love him or hate him, film critics are an essential part of the Hollywood machine. They impact the conversation surrounding a movie and can define a film's legacy. So unless they're dreading bad reviews, movie studios usually allow critics to view advanced screenings of their films. That way, good reviews can build buzz and get people excited before a movie hits theaters. But in 2017, Disney laid the hammer down, refusing to give an advanced screening of Thor Ragnarok to the Los Angeles Times. So what motivated Disney to keep the Times out of Asgard? Well, the paper had published a series of stories on the relationship between the movie studio and the city of Anaheim, California, where Disney is based. According to the Times, Anaheim gives the company an insane amount of perks, 
and Disney has even tried to influence the city's elections. Obviously, Disney wasn't crazy about this kind of scrutiny, and while it never denied the stories were true, it enacted a ban against the newspaper, starting with Thor Ragnarok. However, in the wake of Disney's move against the LA Times, pretty much every journalist in the US banded together to fight the studio. Multiple critics' organizations refused to consider Disney films for awards, and outlets such as the Washington Post and the New York Times said they wouldn't attend Disney events. Disney rescinded the ban after four days. Perhaps the most notorious scandal to ever hit the MCU, the James Gunn controversy started in 2018 when a group of right-wing Twitter users delved deep into the director's Twitter feed. They unearthed a series of controversial tweets about some pretty dark topics. And while Gunn meant them as jokes, they really weren't at all funny. This revelation prompted Disney to fire Gunn from the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise, which turned the Marvel world upside down. Twitter erupted over Gunn's firing, and the cast of Guardians all stuck up for Gunn, signing a petition asking Disney to hire him back. Gunn himself profusely apologized for the tweets, saying he changed as a person over the years and no longer made such provocative jokes. Others pointed out that the folks who brought down Gunn were probably less worried about his inappropriate tweets and more interested in silencing a high-profile critic of President Donald Trump. Wishing to avoid controversy, Disney stuck by its guns and refused to bring Gunn back until 2019. The House of Mouse had searched for someone to replace the director but to no avail. And then news broke that Gunn had been hired by DC to write and direct a Suicide Squad sequel. Shortly afterward, Disney rehired Gunn to finish his sci-fi trilogy. It was an unprecedented move for the company, and while some fans were disappointed, most were elated to see Gunn back in charge of the Guardians. When it comes to Asian representation, the MCU has been plagued by a whole heap of problems. When Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2 soared into theaters, most fans were pleased with the latest installment in James Gunn's planned trilogy. However, the character of Mantis proved especially troublesome for critics of the film. In the comics, Mantis is a feminist icon, a powerful psychic, and a formidable warrior who has defeated the likes of Thor, Iron Man, and Black Panther. This woman can hold her own with Marvel's best, but that's obviously not the version we got in the James Gunn film. Played by Pom Clementia, the MCU Mantis is timid and fearful. On top of that, she constantly refers to Ego as master, and some have argued this plays into racist stereotypes about Asian women being submissive. Even Steve Englehart, who co-created the comic's character, came out and said, I was not happy with Mantis's portrayal. That character has nothing to do with Mantis. Then there's Doctor Strange. During production on the film, director Scott Derrickson realized that gender swapping the Sorcerer Supreme would cause him to stumble into another Asian stereotype, that of the Dragon Lady, a domineering and mysterious Asian woman of age with duplicitous motives. To get around this, he cast Tilda Swinton in the role, which frustrated critics anyway, who accused Derrickson and Marvel of whitewashing the character. In 2019, however, Marvel took a step in the right direction by announcing its first-ever Asian-led film, Shang-Chi. That project isn't without controversy either, though, and the hero's complicated past has stirred up criticism in China. According to the South China Morning Post, Marvel fans took to Weibo, China's version of Twitter, to voice their frustrations about Shang-Chi's father, Fu Manchu a white-hating Chinese mystic who was created to play into fears of the so-called Yellow Peril. Luckily, there's no way you could put Fu Manchu on the silver screen today, and as long as Marvel realizes that, they should be able to avoid provoking controversy over the character, this time at least. For almost a hundred years, the films of Warner Brothers have captivated audiences around the world. Behind the scenes, however, the studio has found itself at the heart of some of Hollywood's most devastating scandals. These are some of the very worst. Following the runaway success of Marvel's shared cinematic universe, Warner Brothers decided to create their own, using some of the most popular superheroes from DC Comics. Unfortunately, the DC Extended Universe has failed to capture even a fraction of the MCU's wild popularity, and the franchise's earliest movies were the most troubled of all. One of the primary characters from the early run of DCEU movies was the superhero Cyborg, first appearing in Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice and later returning for Justice League, actor Ray Fisher has had much to say about his experience with the role. 
especially during filming on that second movie. On June 29, 2020, Fisher sparked controversy when he accused Justice League director Joss Whedon of acting abusively towards his colleagues during filming. Fisher tweeted, Joss Whedon's onset treatment of the cast and crew of Justice League was gross, abusive, unprofessional, and completely unacceptable. Fisher also accused Warner Brothers executives John Berg and Jeff Johns of enabling the director's problematic behavior. Warner Media quickly announced that they would investigate the actor's claims, but the scandal only grew as the studio accused Fisher of being uncooperative during the investigation, after which he provided evidence to the contrary. Fisher's claims were finally vindicated in February 2021, when a number of other actors, including Buffy the Vampire Slayer stars Charisma Carpenter and Sarah Michelle Gellar, levied their own accusations against Whedon. The Me Too movement exposed a number of Hollywood actors, producers, and directors for engaging in inappropriate and even criminal behavior against women in the industry. One such figure was the chairman CEO of Warner Brothers, Kevin Sujihara. Sujihara, who was promoted to the head of the studio in 2013, was found to be having an extramarital affair with actress Charlotte Kirk, and that's just the half of it. The relationship between Kirk and Sujihara allegedly began through a mutual colleague, Australian businessman James Packer. Packer and Kirk met in November 2012, when he was 45 and soon to be divorced, and she was a 20-year-old struggling actress. The pair soon began a relationship. Packer then introduced Kirk to Sujihara in September of the following year. And text messages later showed that Packer then coerced the actress into embracing Sujihara's sexual advances. It was subsequently revealed that, under pressure from Kirk herself, Sujihara had been promising the actress auditions and roles on a number of Warner Brothers projects. The issue had first been investigated in 2017, but it wasn't until 2019 and the rise of Me Too that the dam finally gave away. Sujihara resigned from his position in March of that year. John Barrymore was one of the first great American film stars. Sadly, despite being one of Warner Brothers' most enduring and bankable stars, the actor suffered from alcoholism all his life, an illness that would eventually destroy the pristine image he had established in Hollywood. Nicknamed The Great Profile, Barrymore was a star of both stage and film. His parents, Maurice and Georgiana, were stage actors, while his siblings, Ethel and Lionel Barrymore, both found stardom in Hollywood. Unlike their brother, Ethel and Lionel even won Oscars during their careers, but neither achieved quite the level of critical recognition that he did. Barrymore found his greatest success in the silent movie era and with the talkies that followed in the 1920s and 30s. He had mastered the world of theater decades earlier, however, and it was during that time he famously took on the lead roles in Shakespeare's Hamlet and Richard III. To be or not to be, that is the question. Throughout both of those periods, however, Barrymore's excessive drinking and outrageous behavior gradually destroyed both his reputation and his health. Toward the end of his life, Barrymore declared bankruptcy and was forced to turn to radio in an attempt to make a financial comeback. Fittingly, his final film, Playmates, had Barrymore playing a washed-up Shakespearean actor. Then, during an appearance on a radio program on May 14, 1942, Barrymore announced his retirement from acting. He died just two weeks later. Long before the Me Too movement hit the front pages in the late 2010s, sexual abuse was more or less commonplace in Hollywood. Combine a horde of inflated celebrity egos and nearly unlimited power with an awestruck fan base and actors desperate for work, and a culture of harassment is almost bound to be the result. That being said, when Warner Brothers star Errol Flynn was put on trial for unlawful sex with a minor in 1943, the scandal quickly became front-page news. Flynn had long been typecast as the dashing, energetic hero of adventure cinema. But behind the scenes, he was a notorious drinker and womanizer. Flynn was arrested in 1942 after two women accused the actor of seducing them when they were just 17 years old. In court, Flynn's team of lawyers were able to paint the two women in an unfavorable light, besmirching their reputations by bringing up their previous affairs and abortions. The jury took only 13 hours to acquit Flynn. Despite avoiding jail time, however, Flynn's reputation took a permanent hit, and he never again reached the level of fame he had once enjoyed. 
From the late 1930s through to the 1950s, the House Un-American Activities Committee held a number of hearings that became practically synonymous with the fear and paranoia of the Red Scare. During World War II, the Warners had become outspoken critics of the Axis powers, and even worked with the U.S. government to produce patriotic anti-fascist content. After the war ended and the Soviet-U.S. rivalry came to the fore, the studios and the government turned their guns against the left wing of the political spectrum. Less than two months following the end of World War II, striking workers at Warner Brothers fought non-strikers as the former group blocked the employee entrance, resulting in a number of injuries. The day became known as Black Friday, and neither Warner Brothers nor the government would soon forget the event. When Jack Warner testified at an HUAC hearing in 1947, he accused a dozen individuals of being hardened communists. However, not only were many of the accused not communists, but at least one, the screenwriter Howard Koch, was only named by Warner as revenge for his involvement in the strike of 45. Whatever Happened to Baby Jane is one of Hollywood's most iconic films, due in part to the bitter rivalry between its two leads, Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. The feud between the two actresses began decades prior to the making of the 1962 film. When Davis first entered the movie industry, Crawford was already an established star, with a glamorous Hollywood marriage to actor Douglas Fairbanks Jr. to boot. In 1933, Davis's film, Ex Lady, was about to be announced by Warner Brothers as the first with her name above the title. Suddenly, however, Crawford announced her divorce from Fairbanks, stealing the headlines and crippling the film's promotion. Two years later, Crawford married actor Franchet Tone, with whom Davis had worked and fallen in love that same year. By the time the two paired for Baby Jane, they had spent decades trading jabs and spreading rumors. Inevitably, the set itself became a battleground. They spent nights complaining about each other to director Robert Aldrich, openly spoke ill of one another on set, and even physically hurt each other while filming. Then, at the 1963 Oscars, Crawford got the last laugh, when Davis lost the Best Actress award to Anne Bancroft. Bancroft was absent that night, so none other than Crawford herself arranged to accept the award in her place. She went to all the New York nominees and said, if you can't get out there, I'll accept your award. And uh, please do not vote for her. When New Hollywood took shape in the counterculture in film schools of the 1960s and 70s, many of the regulations and taboos that were once placed on movies became irrelevant. And among the most shocking, controversial movies that followed was Stanley Kubrick's 1971 thriller, A Clockwork Orange. Though Warner Brothers had released plenty of controversial films before, Kubrick's film remains infamous for the backlash it received upon its initial release. The movie follows the main character, Alex, played by Malcolm McDowell, a young teenage boy who, with his gang of droogs, inflicts violence upon random people in a future punk England. In an interview with The Guardian, McDowell later revealed that he had watched violent movies and concentration camp footage for months with Kubrick in order to prepare for the role. Upon release, British officials lobbied to have A Clockwork Orange cut from circulation for fear teens would mimic the violence it portrayed. Following a handful of incidents of young people committing crimes and the film being blamed for those incidents, Kubrick and Warner Brothers withdrew the movie from release in 1974. A Clockwork Orange had also been banned in South Africa and Brazil and had to be cut down significantly to appease the censors in Argentina. In the end, the British film authorities gave the movie the rarest and most severe classification, an X rating. A great number of tragedies have befallen former child stars. Most often, this comes down to a combination of an unstable home life, a reliance on individuals who don't have the child's best interest at heart, and the development of a number of unhealthy addictions and beliefs. Unfortunately, one of Hollywood's greatest actresses, Natalie Wood, experienced all this and more. Wood's abuse began in her own home by her overbearing mother, Maria Gurdon, who pushed the child into acting at the young age of five. In one emotional episode, Gurdon tore the wings off a butterfly to make her daughter cry on cue. Then, while filming The Green Promise in 1949, a 10-year-old Wood suffered a broken wrist during a scene. Her mother forced her to hide the injury, and her wrist never healed correctly. Wood hid the protruding bone with bracelets for the remainder of her life. By the age of 14, Natalie had appeared in over 20 films. During her teen years, in which she was signed with Warner Brothers, Wood was coerced into relationships with much older men, 
such as Frank Sinatra and Nicholas Ray, her director on Rebel Without a Cause. According to Suzanne Finstad's book, Natasha, the biography of Natalie Wood, Wood was then assaulted by an unnamed movie star at the age of 16. Wood's death at 43 years old remains one of Hollywood's great mysteries, as many still believe her husband, actor Robert Wagner, might have played a role in it. Of course, Warner Brothers isn't just a meaningless name. The Warners, Harry, Albert, Sam, and Jack, all built and ran the company that turned their name into an American institution. At the same time, however, there were a number of skeletons in their closets. None of the brothers were much alike. In fact, Hollywood Stories summarizes the four brothers as such. The womanizing Jack, the conservative Harry, the quiet Albert, and the visionary Sam. Despite their differences, however, the four were able to get along for a period, until 1927, when Sam Warner, whose contributions helped make the first ever talkie, died of a brain tumor two days before its release. The jazz singer was a hit and became a game changer in Hollywood. After Sam's death, however, Jack and the two surviving brothers spent the rest of their days feuding. Harry and Jack's relationship was the most strained in the family, and their clashing personalities led to a number of conflicts. Harry was quiet and conservative, whereas Jack was wild and flamboyant. Jack was known as a playboy, while Harry was married just the once. Harry also refused to help the HUAC during its hearings, while Jack was more than happy to smear his enemies as communists. Their relationship finally came to an abrupt end when Jack tricked Albert and Harry into selling their shares of the company, just so Jack could buy it all and become the head. After that, the brothers never spoke again. HBO has long been known for pushing the boundaries of what most people will watch. Over the years, the premium TV channel has courted scandal with its range of adult programming, but some of HBO's gambles have turned into missteps. Here are the biggest scandals to have hit HBO. HBO has been talking about its upcoming alternate history drama for a while now, but Confederate appears to be stalled as of February 2019. Vulture, however, reports that the network swears the delay has nothing to do with any kind of controversy. So what is the controversy? Well, as you might have guessed from the title, Confederate will present an alternate history in which the Union ended up losing the Civil War, and slavery was never abolished. Yep, go ahead and cringe. It will be a story about slavery in the ages of iPhones, the internet, and pay television. Now, even if you can forget that a Confederate victory wouldn't necessarily have meant an end to the evolution of human morality, the whole idea is still kind of repugnant. It's hugely insensitive to the modern struggles of black Americans, and it's also likely that plenty of unscrupulous people will interpret the show's themes and ideas in some unfortunate ways. Luckily, it may be a while before Confederate goes into production. The show was meant to be spearheaded by David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, the showrunners of Game of Thrones, who were also about to start work on the first of a series of Star Wars movies. That means Confederate won't hit screens for many years to come, if it sees the light of day at all. Film and television productions can get away with a whole heap of hijinks. Stars can show up drunk, directors can come out with some pretty stupid stuff on social media, and all kinds of collateral damage can take place, without ever harming the production itself. Hurt an animal, however, and people will start to feel a lot less generous. According to the Huffington Post, back in 2012, HBO had a short-lived series called Luck, which starred Dustin Hoffman and was about the often ugly world of horse racing. Unfortunately for HBO and pretty much everyone involved in the series, some of the ugliness of the real-world sport made its way into the show's production. It didn't take long for Luck's luck to run out. As it turns out, horses are very large and easily startled, making them far more accident-prone than other animal stars. The problems for Luck started right out of the gate when a horse broke a leg during the pilot episode and had to be put down. After Luck's third onset equine death, the network released a statement defending its safety record while simultaneously explaining why it couldn't guarantee that it could keep its four-legged stars safe. It read, Safety is always of paramount concern. We maintained the highest safety standards throughout production, higher in fact than any protocols existing in horse racing anywhere, with many fewer incidents than occur in racing or than befall horses normally in barns at night or pastures. While we maintain the highest safety standards possible, accidents unfortunately happen and it is impossible to guarantee they won't in the future. Well, there's one way to guarantee those accidents stop happening. Cancel the show, which is exactly what HBO did. 
Yeah, yeah, Louis C.K. said something offensive. Big deal, right? These days, it feels like the contentious comedian can't even open his mouth without stirring up controversy. This time, though, it wasn't just C.K. being offensive. It was also Chris Rock and Ricky Gervais, while Jerry Seinfeld looked on in disgust. According to USA Today, the incident happened in 2011 on an HBO special called Talking Funny. On the show, Chris Rock told CK he was the blackest white guy I know, causing CK to inexplicably come back at him with a serious racial slur. You're saying I'm a Yes. Instead of staring on in horror as CK took the joke too far, Rock then responded in turn, and then, even more inexplicably, Ricky Gervais cracked up. And not in an uncomfortable or shocked kind of way either. Only Jerry Seinfeld seemed uncomfortable. I don't think he, he could do that. Oh, what? Uh, I don't think he has those There's qualities. Only two. And then, as Rock and CK went on to explain why it's okay for them to use that word, Seinfeld seemed to resign himself to his co-star's attempts at humor. You found the humor of it. Yeah. I haven't found it. Right. Nor do I seek it. Curiously enough, this incident didn't cause many waves on social media at the time, but came to light years later after CK was caught up in another career-wrecking scandal. How we got away with it in the first place, however, is anyone's guess. Ari Shavit's book, My Promised Land, is a love story to the nation of Israel, and it had such a profound impact on HBO chief Richard Plepler that he wanted to make it into a film. During a panel at the 2014 INTV conference in Jerusalem, he said, "...what a privilege to capture the essential truths of this book and to make a film that could reach millions of people, not only in Israel and the U.S., but all over the world." Then, a reporter named Danielle Barron came forward with a story. She didn't exactly name Shavit as the man who, quote, lurched at her like a barnyard animal, but she did say her attacker was a well-known Israeli journalist who had just written an important book. Everyone sort of figured it out regardless, and Shavit insisted it had all been what he called a misunderstanding. Then a second woman came forward with similar accusations, and Shavit kept on insisting he had no idea his actions would upset anyone, and that he was very sorry. It was too late for HBO, though, which was already in the end stages of the My Promised Land documentary. In a 2016 statement, the network said, "...there is nothing more to say at this time except that this project is in the post-production slash editing stage." In late 2017, two more women came forward with accusations against Shavit. As of 2019, My Promised Land is still not listed among HBO's offerings. T.J. Miller, who starred in the HBO series Silicon Valley, has been wrestling with the same misconduct allegations since before he was a star. The accusation comes from an anonymous accuser, who says Miller hit, choked, and sexually assaulted her while the two were in college. Miller denies it all, and he even issued a statement to the Daily Beast that basically said his accuser was using the current climate as a place to, in his words, bandwagon, despite the fact she kept her identity secret. Miller said, "...it is unfortunate that she's choosing this route as it undermines the important movement to make women feel safe coming forward about legitimate claims against real known predators." Unfortunately for Miller, the Daily Beast tracked down people who could corroborate the details of his accuser's story, although the original incident was handled by the student court at the university, and privacy laws prohibited them from discussing the outcome. Miller graduated early, but was also expelled after he graduated, which seems to indicate that something didn't go well for him. By the time the accusations resurfaced, T.J. Miller was no longer working on Silicon Valley, so HBO got off the hook by issuing a simple statement. There were no reports of sexual misconduct during T.J. Miller's time working at HBO. Considering Brexit has been one of the most controversial political issues in recent British history, it's no surprise that a movie about the subject should be equally contentious. In Brexit, The Uncivil War, Benedict Cumberbatch plays Dominic Cummings, the man behind the Brexit campaign. Cummings was always a highly controversial figure, and the film doesn't paint him in an especially even light. Is it immigration? Is it immigration? You can be honest. Is it immigration? What about immigration? Is it race? Is it different races not mixing? Is it race not being integrated? Of course, if you're a Brit who did vote for Brexit, the Uncivil War's depiction of Cummings isn't going to put your beliefs in a particularly sympathetic light either. But even the film's timing is controversial, because in the real world, there's an ongoing investigation into the tactics of the pro-Brexit campaign, and some critics say the film could inadvertently interfere with that. One journalist has compared it to a hypothetical scenario in which an American studio released a film about the Mueller investigation while it was still ongoing, something which probably wouldn't make a lot of people happy. Most episodes of Game of Thrones are pretty gory, to say the least, so you might be forgiven for thinking it would be kinda cute for the show to sponsor a blood drive. 
When this actually happened, however, things didn't go too well. According to the Daily Beast, the blood drive was called Bleed for the Throne, and participants were entered to win a trip to the season premiere in New York, and also received a limited-edition Iron Throne t-shirt. That wasn't the bad part, though. The real news behind the blood drive was that gay men were excluded from participating, unless they'd been celibate for at least 12 months. The reason? Because the FDA said so. Gay men have actually been prohibited from donating blood since the early years of the AIDS epidemic. Today, it's a pointless and discriminatory restriction, since HIV isn't exclusively a disease of the gay community, and donated blood is already screened for infectious diseases. There were alternate ways for people who couldn't donate to enter the competition, but the press materials didn't exactly make that information obvious. And even still, it seems like the kind of thing that ought to remain in the past. Before Brett Kavanaugh, there was Clarence Thomas, the original Supreme Court member to have been accused of sexual misconduct. As you probably know by now, HBO is pretty fond of making movies about this issue, so naturally, they decided they were going to make one about Clarence Thomas and his accuser, Anita Hill. According to The Wrap, however, DC lawmakers weren't especially pleased with confirmation, mostly because they were annoyed about its portrayals of themselves. Former Senator Alan Simpson of Wyoming even said he'd sue, saying at the time, "...an attack unanswered is an attack believed." That was back in 2016, though, and nothing seems to have come of his threats. Simpson also complained that the script seriously distorted the actual events of 1991, when Anita Hill was called to testify at Thomas's Senate confirmation hearing. In response to Simpson's complaints, HBO defended their process and said the film was well-researched and vetted, and that it also, quote, "...speaks for itself." For centuries, elephants have been horribly abused by their captors. They're not domesticated animals, so the only way to make them do what humans want is to be inexcusably cruel to them. Unfortunately, things aren't much different today, even in Hollywood. According to Show Snob, Westworld got into trouble with PETA in 2018, not just because they employed elephants on their show, but also because the elephants came from a company that PETA says is known for its abusive training practices. PETA even dug up a video which appears to show the abusive training of one of the elephants specifically used in that episode. Obviously, it's cheaper to use real elephants than to painstakingly animate them with CGI. But if Game of Thrones can do it with all their direwolves and dragons, it seems like Westworld could have too, and avoided the whole ugly scandal in the process. An elephant. Uh, no elephants, Your Grace. That's disappointing. The American Broadcasting Company first hit the airways back in 1943 and has been a steady presence on both the TV and radio ever since. Over the years, however, ABC has endured a number of foul-ups and controversies. These are the massive scandals that rocked ABC hard. Project Veritas is a controversial far-right organization that is notorious for going after traditional news outlets and politically liberal candidates and organizations. In 2019, they released a video that seemed to cross political lines in a rare moment of solidarity. The video depicted an ABC News anchor candidly complaining that her bosses had prevented her from publishing the now infamous Jeffrey Epstein story for three years. With cameras rolling but not broadcasting, anchor Amy Robach said, the palace found out that we had her whole allegations about Prince Andrew and threatened us in a million different ways. It was unbelievable what we had. I tried for three years to get it on to no avail, and now it's all coming out, and I freaking had all of it." Robark later walked back her comments, saying she had been, quote, "...caught in a private moment of frustration." She said, "...in the years since, no one ever told me or the team to stop reporting on Jeffrey Epstein." A separate statement released by ABC claimed, "...at the time, not all of our reporting met our standards to air, but we have never stopped investigating the story." Matt Gutman joined ABC in 2008. Since then, he has reported from 40 different countries around the world, garnering multiple awards for his journalism, and for the last several years has been chief national correspondent for some of ABC's most important news programs. Gutman is based in Los Angeles and was one of the first to report on the sudden death of basketball legend Kobe Bryant in a helicopter crash in January 2020. As the news was still breaking and details about the tragedy were still trickling out, Gutman reported that Bryant and all four of his children were among the dead. Social media was already awash with grief for the Lakers star, which quickly turned into outrage over Gutman's erroneous report. He later apologized on air. The coroner is going to make the final determination of who exactly was on uh, that plane, but again, I apologize uh, for those remarks earlier. Gutman apologized again on social media the next day. Then, a few days later, he apologized yet again, accepting personal responsibility in a statement to the media. 
But that didn't stop ABC from issuing their own affirmation. The company said, Reporting the facts accurately is the cornerstone of our journalism. As he acknowledged on Sunday, Matt Gutman's initial reporting was not accurate and failed to meet our editorial standards. Roseanne was an ABC sitcom chronicling the middle-class crudities of the titular heroine and her family. One of the network's most popular shows in the 90s, it was revived in 2018 with most of the original cast, including Roseanne Barr. Barr has always been something of a controversial figure, however, both in and out of the show. The show regularly courted controversy with episodes on hot-button topics like homophobia, racism, and abortion. But Barr has also had a history of controversy, having made a number of troubling comments over the years. Still, the show made a triumphant return to ABC in 2018, attracting an unprecedented 18.2 million viewers with its first episode and becoming the most-watched series of the broadcast season. However, about a week after ABC's announcement that another new season had been ordered, Barr sent a racist tweet to an advisor to former President Barack Obama. She later deleted the tweet, apologized profusely, and said she had been, in her words, ambient tweeting. But Barr's apologies didn't do her much good. Not only was the next season of Roseanne canceled, but ABC launched The Connors, a spin-off series soon after, and had her character killed off for good measure. George Stephanopoulos is one of ABC's most prominent news personalities. He joined the network in 1997, coming directly from the White House, where he was President Bill Clinton's senior advisor for policy and strategy. But Stephanopoulos' relationship with the Clintons would become a source of embarrassment for ABC in 2015, when it was revealed he had been donating $25,000 a year to the Clinton Foundation. Stephanopoulos later apologized on a show, saying he, quote, should have gone the extra mile to avoid even the appearance of a conflict. But I should have made additional disclosures on air when we covered the foundation, and I now believe that directing personal donations to that foundation was a mistake. CNN described the reactions to his apology as mixed. Many critics noted that the scandal was made all the worse as Stephanopoulos was personally covering the Clinton Foundation at the time. One writer for Politico wrote, the donation corrodes much of the journalistic credibility Stephanopoulos has labored so carefully to accumulate. Nonetheless, Stephanopoulos seems to have weathered the scandal. While many Republicans and conservative commentators predictably demanded that ABC ban Stephanopoulos from anchoring political coverage in the 2016 election, their efforts amounted to nothing. Breaking stories are notoriously difficult to cover accurately, especially when the event in question is violent and chaotic. Take the July 2012 mass shooting at a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, for example. During a midnight showing of The Dark Knight Rises, a man opened fire on hundreds of moviegoers, killing 12. During ABC News' initial reporting to the shooting, the company claimed that it had correctly identified the suspect because the reporters had called his mother, who had confirmed it. The mother subsequently disputed the report, however, saying that the reporters had misunderstood her when she said, quote, you have the right person, which was actually a reference to her identity over the phone, not her son's as the killer. ABC's mistake was compounded by yet another misidentification as part of their initial report, basing their assumption off a web profile of a separate man with the same name. Both the network and the reporter involved apologized the same day. In 1995, Disney acquired ABC for $19 billion, making it the third largest corporate merger in history at the time, and kind of a win-win for everyone involved. But by 2002, a bad economy and low ratings had prompted Disney executives to shake things up at ABC. To do this, they replaced the long-running news program 2020 with a Disney show, inserted entertainment programs into news hour slots, and even tried to lure David Letterman from CBS, effectively ending the more than 20-year run of Nightline. Replacing a hard news program with The Late Show may seem like a strange decision, but the two programs had actually been competing in overlapping time slots for 20 years, with Nightline frequently coming out on top. The problem was that Disney's offer was a violation of Nightline anchor Ted Koppel's contract as well as a hugely unpopular move for the general public. In fact, Letterman was so embarrassed by ABC's attempt to court him that he even offered to be the first guest on Koppel's new interview show. In April 2004, America was three years into the Afghanistan war and one year into the war in Iraq. Especially in light of the year's coming presidential election, both conflicts weighed on voters' minds. So in their last broadcast of the month, Nightline devoted the entire hour to reading the names and showing the pictures of all 721 United States service members killed in Iraq since the war began. Anchor Ted Koppel closed the broadcast by saying, The reading tonight of those 721 names was neither intended to provoke opposition to the war, nor was it meant as an endorsement. Sinclair Broadcasting Group prevented this episode from airing on its local affiliates, prompting a stern rebuke from Republican Senator John McCain. Sinclair is well known for being a conservative-leaning media group, so their actions certainly seem politically motivated. The program was actually far more successful than ABC's producers had expected, which led to Fox News airing their own alternative list, listing what America had apparently accomplished in Iraq. 
ABC then repeated their stunt a month later, with Koppel reading out casualties from Afghanistan, and then a year after that, reciting the names of the soldiers killed in Iraq since a previous broadcast. For years, the American freelance journalist Nate Thayer had been hunting for the former Cambodian dictator Pol Pot. He finally tracked him down in 1997 and wrangled his way into conducting what would be the last ever interview with the mass murdering architect of the killing fields. Thayer met with ABC News star Ted Koppel about broadcasting the interview on ABC for $300,000 in full credit. It subsequently aired on Nightline as an ABC News exclusive, which isn't what they allegedly agreed to. Thayer, in turn, sued ABC News for stealing his work. According to the lawsuit, ABC did the exact opposite of everything the company had agreed to. Thayer later said, Koppel returned home with a copy of my videotape. I gave it to him in exchange for his strict promise that its only use would be on Nightline. However, once he had a copy of the tape, ABC News released video, still pictures, and even transcripts of my interviews to news organizations throughout the world, and they didn't even pay him. When Thayer was later nominated for a Peabody Award for the video, credited as an ABC News correspondent, he turned down the award in anger. Koppel called to congratulate him on the award, but Thayer wasn't having it. I'm going to go to the Peabody Award ceremony and refuse the award and tell the planet what unethical thieves ABC are and how you, Ted Koppel, acted as their pimp. He was banned from the award ceremony as a result. The lawsuit was later settled by both parties, but Thayer wouldn't receive his money until 15 years later. Brian Ross was a veteran ABC reporter of 24 years. Since joining ABC, Ross had been awarded multiple Peabody Awards, a half dozen Emmys, and over a dozen other awards for excellence in journalism and broadcasting. A longtime colleague at ABC even told the Washington Post that Ross and his decades-long partner Rhonda Schwartz, quote, were the star investigative team of ABC News. The president of ABC News, in a memo printed in the New York Times, once said, their work has led repeatedly to real changes in policy in the U.S. and around the world. Unfortunately, a single mistake brought Ross and Schwartz's careers crashing down. In December 2017, Ross failed to fact-check a piece in which he reported that Lt. Gen. Michael Flynn said that then-candidate Donald Trump had instructed him to contact Russian officials during the 2016 election campaign. This was a massive scoop that, for a while, set the world of American politics on fire, but it turned out to be largely baseless. ABC were aghast, and the network issued an official apology and retraction, explaining the story, quote, fell far short of their news standards. Ross had made mistakes with his work in the past, but this is the one that got him fired. He and his partner later moved to the Law & Crime Network. In 2019, two of ABC's premiere shows had to issue retractions and apologies after airing a truly embarrassing error. An October Sunday edition of World News Tonight broadcast a video that the ABC anchor described as showing Turkey's military bombing Kurd civilians in a Syrian border town. The segment was then replayed on Good Morning America the following morning. However, the video was quickly cast in doubt by a Gizmodo report that afternoon. It turned out that the Knob Creek gun range in Kentucky holds nighttime public shoots twice a year, and that the explosions in the video were identical to those seen in a video filmed at the range. Within a few hours, both Good Morning America and World News Tonight tweeted, Correction, we've taken down video that appeared to be from the Syrian border immediately after questions were raised about its accuracy. ABC News regrets the error. That evening, Knob Creek gun range posted on Facebook that it was, quote, marked safe from the Turkish invasion in Kentucky today and thanked ABC News for the free advertising. Just about every popular entertainment franchise has had its share of scandal, and despite its high-minded ideals, the Star Trek universe is no exception. Here are the biggest scandals to boldly go where no scandals have gone before. If you're a fan of Star Trek, you probably have a lot of gratitude in your heart for Gene Roddenberry, the man who introduced Mr. Spock and Captain Kirk to the world. But it turns out that the creator of Star Trek may have been a bit of a jerk. Maybe that shouldn't come as a huge surprise, though. The original Star Trek, after all, often featured women in skirts so short that bending over to retrieve a fumbled communicator was never an option. Furthermore, many of the women in those early episodes weren't exactly the strong, self-sufficient type. And that's probably because Roddenberry didn't really respect women all that much. Before reaching Reaching the height of his fame, he was already well known for having affairs with secretaries, and once he was firmly established in Hollywood, there was no stopping him. While married to his first wife, he was having an affair with actress Majel Barrett, whom he would later marry, and it wasn't exactly a secret. He also had an affair with Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura. A former assistant to a Trek writer told the National Review, Roddenberry would have women walking from the costume designer's fitting rooms through to his office in the skimpiest outfit so he could perv them. Roddenberry's vision was definitely worthy of respect, but the man himself, perhaps not so much. 
George Takei, who played Sulu in the original Star Trek, is openly and unapologetically gay and a fearless champion of LGBTQ rights. With that in mind, actor and writer Simon Pegg decided that the rebooted version of Sulu, as played by John Cho, ought to be gay too. So Pegg wrote a scene for 2016's Star Trek Beyond in which Sulu is depicted raising a child with a male partner. Because there really hasn't been an LGBT mm -hmm. character yeah. in the Star Trek universe and, and people have been um, very uh, great about it. It was meant to be a respectful homage to Takei, who came out in 2005. Everyone thought that he would love the new direction for the character, but alas, he didn't. He told The Hollywood Reporter, I'm delighted that there's a gay character. Unfortunately, it's a twisting of Gene Roddenberry's creation, to which he put in so much thought. I think it's really unfortunate. According to Takei, Roddenberry never envisioned Sulu as gay, even though he was a supporter of LGBTQ rights even before all those initials existed. When Takei found out about the new plans for the character, he tried to convince John Cho that a completely new gay character would be a better choice. After all, if Sulu did turn out to be gay, it's pretty clear he was in the closet all those years, and it's disappointing to imagine that in the 23rd century there would still be that closet. Every major franchise that boasts rabid fans is going to inspire fan fiction. Some creators love and even encourage it, while others find it endlessly annoying and call it copyright infringement. Star Trek tends to lean toward the latter. There's even a list of guidelines that filmmakers should follow if they want to produce a Star Trek fan film. They limit all such films to no more than two 15-minute episodes, no bootleg props or costumes, no professional actors or producers, no fundraising in excess of $50,000, and no distribution for profit. So essentially, you can make a film, but you can't make money off of it. But you can help enrich the franchise by only using official merchandise. There's been at least one high-profile case of these rules being broken. The fan film Axonar was slated to be feature-length. It was supposed to star professionals like Richard Hatch and Tony Todd, and it had a million dollars in crowds sourced money to back it up. Unsurprisingly, Paramount and CBS took the team behind Axanar to court in 2015, and the filmmakers ultimately lost. Under the terms of the settlement, Axanar was allowed to go forward, but only as two 15-minute installments. Gene Roddenberry was rarely happy with any script anyone gave him. After all, Star Trek was his vision, and it's really hard for other writers to get into the head of a visionary and produce work that precisely lines up with his standards. One of the most beloved Star Trek episodes of all time is The City on the Edge of Forever, a time-traveling tale written by Harlan Ellison. The script accomplished all the things that fans love about Trek, as it featured important themes and a meaningful story. But despite Ellison's credit, the script was ultimately largely rewritten by Roddenberry, as well as other regular Star Trek writers. TV Guide called it one of the 100 greatest moments in television history, okay. Most writers understand that rewrites and editing are part of the process, and most of them will happily accept the credit even if the rewrites don't fall exactly in line with their own personal vision. Not Harlan Ellison, though. He went to his grave more than 50 years after The City on the Edge of Forever first aired, still angry that the script had been edited. I felt that uh, they had mucked it up badly, and uh, it took, I think, six or seven years before Gene Roddenberry even, and I even spoke to each other again. At one point, he demanded to have his name removed from the credits. In 1995, he even published the original version of the script, which included a rambling opening in which he lamented the, quote, greedy little pig snout who ruined everything. Fans have been commenting for a long time about the sometimes uncanny similarities between Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5. But until recently, the evidence that one of them stole from the other was mostly circumstantial. Babylon 5 was pitched to Paramount before Warner Brothers picked it up, but then Paramount later went on to greenlight Deep Space Nine. Babylon 5 creator J. Michael Straczynski just ignored the similarities between the two, mostly because he disliked the idea of spending money on litigation and the general ugliness that would ensue. But then in 2013, a commenter on on an io9 article about babylon 5 came forward with some information wait picking up disturbance trying to get a fix the commenter claimed to have been working at Warner Brothers during the time that both series were conceived. He said that Warner Brothers and Paramount had actually been planning to launch a joint television network featuring one science fiction series, Deep Space Nine. But Warner Brothers had already agreed to purchase Babylon 5. As the commenter put it, I was told they purposely took what they liked from the B5 script and put it in the DS9 script. In fact, there was talk of leaving the B5 script intact and just setting it in the Star Trek universe. In the end, though, the joint network never happened. Ironically, that might be what ultimately saved Babylon 5, since the two shows wouldn't have gone forward separately if the deal hadn't fallen through. Today, women have more professional opportunities than ever, and it's generally easier for them to pursue careers in traditionally male industries, though the landscape is still far from perfect. Decades earlier, it was even harder, and that was true even in the Star Trek writer's room. 
In 1960, Dorothy Fontana was an aspiring scriptwriter working as a production secretary on a Western series called The Tall Man. Her boss knew about her ambitions and encouraged her to show him some story ideas, which led to her first sale at the age of 20. She had a lot of success with The Tall Man, but she was having some trouble selling her ideas to other showrunners. As she told Future Science Fiction Digest in 2019, people would say, I don't know if Dorothy can write this. Up to that moment, I had put Dorothy C. Fontana on my scripts, so I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write a script for Ben Casey, which was a series also on our lot, and I'm going to write DC Fontana on the front page. According to Fontana, using initials was her idea, but some sources say she continued to use them because Gene Roddenberry thought she would get less respect if she wrote under her own name. Occasionally, she would even use the male pseudonym Michael Richards. The Star Trek universe is a utopia of progressive ideals, but in the harsh reality of the real world, it was made possible through cheap non-union labor. According to the book Star Trek FAQ, everything left to know about the first voyages of the Starship Enterprise, costume designer William Theiss was under a lot of pressure to produce enough costumes for the many actors on the original series. So much pressure, in fact, that he decided he simply couldn't accomplish the task in a way that was completely ethical. Theiss spent time looking for weird, futuristic-looking fabrics in discount fabric stores, and then he would bring them to his regiment of seamstresses working inside the apartment he'd rented near the studio. The seamstresses, who were all non-union, would violate union rules by working through the night in order to get the costumes finished in time for production. So all those outfits in that progressive utopian society were basically made in a sweatshop. Star Trek has never shied away from using sex appeal to get ratings, but at least off-camera, the actors usually got to escape from all the gawking. Unfortunately for Jerry Ryan, who played Seven of Nine on Star Trek Voyager, nobody ever got tired of looking. Her personal life even became a huge political scandal for her ex-husband Jack Ryan when he was running for Senate in Illinois against an up-and-coming Barack Obama in the 2004 election. Attorneys from media organizations obtained the details of the couple's divorce, in which Jerry said that her husband would often take her to bizarre clubs against her will and pressure her to get busy in front of another couple. Obama, to his credit, said it wouldn't be appropriate for him to comment on what was in those divorce papers. Ryan ended up dropping out of the race and was replaced by another candidate as Obama went on to win the election. Most people who knew Gene Roddenberry acknowledged that he was a genius, but they also had less flattering things to say about him, like that he was controlling and apparently quite greedy. That was clear enough after he hired composer Alexander Courage to write the Star Trek theme music and then basically stole half the credit. In the entertainment industry, composers are paid royalties every time their songs are played on TV. After about a year of Courage collecting all those royalties, Roddenberry had enough of some other guy getting the credit for his show's theme song, so he wrote some lyrics to go along with the tune and was then able to claim half the royalties as a co-composer, even though the lyrics were never used on the air or anywhere else. Courage, naturally, was incensed. Even though the move was legal, it was obvious to everyone that Roddenberry deserved none of the credit or royalties for the score. When pressed, Roddenberry simply said, Hey, I have to get some money somewhere. I'm sure not going to get it out of the profits of Star Trek. Gates McFadden played Dr. Beverly Crusher in Star Trek The Next Generation. She was a popular character, but by the end of Season 1, she was gone, and no one really had any idea why. There were lots of rumors, with McFadden believing that her departure had to do with the male writer-producer whom she clashed with over what she saw as sexist writing. Producer Rick Berman wasn't shy about saying who this male writer-producer actually was. He told Redeeming Culture, The head writer on the show during the first season was a gentleman named Maurice Hurley. Wonderful guy. Maurice did not like Gates. He had a real bone to pick with Gates. They just didn't get along. He didn't like her acting. He didn't like her. Eventually, Hurley convinced Berman to fire McFadden. It didn't last, though, and in fact, Hurley was let go himself not long afterwards. And by the third season, Dr. Crusher made a comeback. McFadden has said that she credited the fans for bringing her back. I know how difficult it was for you being away. Long ago, there was a television network known as the History Channel, and it featured shows about actual history. But today, we have a scandal-ridden reality TV outlet called History. Here are some of its worst offenses against actual reality. It's one of the world's most ridiculous conspiracy theories. The government is filling the air with chemicals so that they can control the weather. Most people understand that this idea is ridiculous, because if it was actually true that the government was filling the air with chemicals in a bid to alter the weather patterns of the United States and beyond, they appear to be really, really bad at it. Most people think the idea is dumb, except History Channel, who evidently felt like it was worth discussing in an episode of That's Impossible called Weather Warfare. The special basically just repeated the whole conspiracy theory and provided a platform to the paranoid people who actually believe it which is not a great thing to do in an era where half the population already doesn't trust science. 
Pawn Stars favorite Austin Lee Russell is better known by his nickname, Chumley. He's portrayed as the comic foil at the Gold and Silver Pawn Shop, where he's often the butt of jokes. Got the squash bus. It takes me 20 minutes to go home. Well, I had to stop and get gas. Chumley. Four hours. Occasionally, he'll impress his fellow pawn shop workers with his talent at the game of pinball. More frequently, he'll deliver his lines in a way that lets you know the money is only barely keeping him on the show. Actually, this thing might even be older than I am. Uh... <laughs> Doubt it. In non-televised reality, though, Chumley's life is somewhat less whimsical and comedic. Police carried out a search of his house while following up on sexual assault allegations in 2016. They didn't find the evidence to convict Chumley of sexual assault, but they did find drugs in his regrettably named Chum Chum room, including marijuana and meth, as well as numerous illegal firearms and quite a few items usually found with people who package and sell narcotics. The reality star was able to avoid time with a plea deal, despite being charged with quite a few felonies. Reality television is part exploitation, part making fun of people who deserve it, and part totally, utterly, and completely fake. But there are lines that even reality television producers try not to cross, and the producers of American Jungle definitely crossed one or two of them. The 2013 show American Jungle was short-lived, so you might not even remember it. It was presented as a show about native Hawaiians from rival groups fighting each other over hunting territory. The Hawaiian government was certainly not amused, claiming the show portrayed the participants in a culturally insensitive way, as well as portraying Hawaii's history inaccurately. According to officials in Hawaii, the show depicted illegal activities too, such as hunting at night and hunting feral cattle without a permit. We're not sure how much any of this had to do with the show's swift cancellation, but it didn't get past its first eight episodes. Shows about hidden treasure and unsolved historical mysteries tend to do well for history, but as anyone who was inspired by Indiana Jones can tell you, real treasure hunting is super boring. A neat collection, George Washington's campaign buttons. You're missing the uh, 1789 inaugural, though. I found one once. That's very fortunate for you. So to get people to actually tune into a show about treasure, you kind of need to sensationalize, embellish, and just make things up as you go along. With that in mind, the accuracy of most treasure hunting shows is questionable at best. The history show Pirate Treasure of the Knights Templar was a short-lived series starring forensic geologist Scott Wolter and treasure hunter Barry Clifford. Their team was searching sunken wrecks off the coast of Madagascar that they believed were connected to the Portuguese Templars. The show was called out for unprofessionalism by UNESCO, which accused them of treating the research and recovery of the vessels recklessly, without proper precautions, and actually damaging the sites. In response, Walter claimed that UNESCO had a personal vendetta, writing on his blog, UNESCO hates Barry Clifford simply because he is the most successful pirate ship discoverer in history. Oh, okay, that must be it. Joseph Frontiera had a comfy little stint as a reality TV star background character on the history series Counting Cars, but then he blew it. Or at least that's what a lawsuit filed against him by his former employers at Counts Customs says. Frontiero was accused of embezzling around $75,000 from the shop and using the money to buy plane tickets and make a down payment on a Range Rover. How did he do this? His accusers think he made rubber stamp copies of the company boss's signatures so the company's checking account could become his own personal checking account. This scandal was big news for a while, but the case was closed in April 2019, obviously finding in favor of Count's Customs. At a certain point, one has to wonder when the History Channel is going to change their name, because they certainly don't seem to be heading down a trajectory of finding more historically accurate subjects to talk about. One of History's semi-recent shows is a scripted drama called Project Blue Book, which is another show about aliens, although this one actually had a lot of factually correct stuff in it. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, for example, was a real person who worked as a scientific consultant for a government program called Project Blue Book, which collected 12,000-plus accounts of unidentified flying objects. The problem with the series is that it just doesn't stick to the real story, and it's not because the real story is super boring, either. It's because it's just not exciting enough for big ratings. So history dumped a whole bunch of made-up stuff into the mix and gave it a stir, so there's just enough untruth that viewers have no idea what's real and what's fake, you know, as any good History Channel should do. Who doesn't love a good Kennedy assassination conspiracy theory? Most people, actually, but that didn't stop history from airing an older docuseries called The Men Who Killed Kennedy, with additional episodes created for the 40th anniversary airing in 2003. The only people who really paid attention to the series were the relatives of Lyndon B. Johnson, because an episode called The Guilty Men implied that it was Johnson himself who plotted to kill Kennedy so he could become president. Johnson's family wanted to be able to rebut the episode, and History Channel tried to appease them by saying they'd hire some experts to review the new episode that they had based on the book Blood, Money, and Power, How LBJ Killed JFK. 
And then, if they found more inaccuracies, they promised to air another program that would publicly debunk the theory. Who's at risk? Who's going to gain the most? Who wins in this deal? There's only one answer to that question, and that's Lyndon Johnson. Well, their experts must have found something implausible in the episode because history did issue an apology during a one-hour special entitled The Guilty Men, A Historical Review, which concluded that the original episode should never have been broadcast. No, it's wrong. It's corrupt. It's dishonest. It's deceitful, and which oh, this film is in its entirety. History's The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch was supposed to be a level-headed scientific analysis of the weird things that happen on the infamous Sherman Ranch in Utah. But when you really sit down and watch the show, you begin to suspect that maybe the team is just using the science to try and back up what they already think they know is happening. Look at that. It looks like an object above the tree. What? And it happens right when the cow moves, raises up. There is even an astrophysicist on the program, but even his theories seem to lean more religious than scientific. By episode 2, viewers were already hate-tweeting and abandoning the show in droves, with one disappointed viewer writing, What investigation? It's just a bunch of dudes playing with high-tech toys. The Knights Templar had a cool name. They were mysterious, they were powerful, and they probably looked awesome in chainmail. The Knights were originally supposed to protect pilgrims crossing into the Holy Land, but they ended up being much more than just bodyguards. They also acquired the blessing of the Pope, who exempted them from taxes and other rules that applied to non-Templars, so they eventually became unusually rich. So rich that they set up a bunch of banks so pilgrims could withdraw money once they were in the Holy Land and not have to worry about getting robbed en route. Yes, the Knights were bankers. Not so according to history's Nightfall, though. In Nightfall, the Knights Templar are an elite fighting force, have a lot of affairs, and get sweaty, but still somehow manage to stay Hollywood attractive underneath all the blood. The show kind of has to embellish the Knights because they probably weren't really an elite fighting force so much as a powerful financial institution, and King Philip IV of France probably took them down because he owed them money. You might get a few guys on Wall Street to tune in for that version of the show, but history's viewers may actually prefer the fiction in this case. Somehow, the title The Men Who Built America made it past history's team of whoever it is that stops terrible titles from happening. As it turns out, The Men Who Built America celebrates the accomplishments of a bunch of really rich dudes. But it also just ignores millions of workers who actually got their hands dirty. And perhaps even more tellingly, downplays or even villainizes the contributions of the people who toiled to bring these visionary heroes' visions to life. One episode in the miniseries depicts the Homestead Steel Strike, but even though the show is a documentary, it gets a lot of the facts completely wrong, implying that there was something sinister about the strike and the workers who plotted against poor wealthy Andrew Carnegie. And so it goes on, asking viewers to venerate all those wealthy men because they built some cars and bridges and loaned a lot of money to people. History doesn't exactly shy away from the morbid or the tasteless, so it should have surprised no one when they publicly announced they'd be making a documentary that would end spectacularly with the exhumation of a corpse. John Dillinger was a gangster who gained infamy in the 1930s for robbing banks and also for being handsome. The end of Dillinger's story is that he was taken down by the FBI and then buried under three feet of concrete. And ever since, there are people who say it wasn't really John Dillinger who got shot by the FBI that night. This rumor has persisted for so long that Dillinger's relatives decided to have him exhumed in order to finally answer the question, and history decided that it should be on video. As it turns out, though, it's not actually that easy to get permission to dig up a corpse, and Dillinger's family had to abandon the idea after a judge dismissed their case against the cemetery, which had denied permission for the exhumation. Before that decision, though, history decided to back out of the project. They didn't say why, but it might have had something to do with the fact that digging up corpses is morbid and morally bankrupt. And again, that hasn't stopped history before. NBC is one of America's oldest broadcasting organizations, so it'll come as no surprise to find that the company has endured a few controversies over the years. From celebrity outbursts to sinister cover-ups, these are the biggest scandals to hit NBC. Since its 1952 premiere, the Today Show has grown into an NBC mainstay. Starting in 1994, Today was helmed for over 20 years by Matt Lauer, one of the network's biggest names, who helped the show reach the heady heights it enjoys to this day. Lauer was also among the highest paid people in news media, earning $20 million a year through his last contract in 2016. That was his last contract because, the next year, NBC fired Lauer after a review of his behavior prompted by a colleague's accusation of sexual misconduct. In a statement, NBC News Chairman Andy Lack said, 
On Monday night, we received a detailed complaint from a colleague about inappropriate sexual behavior in the workplace by Matt Lauer. It represented, after serious review, a clear violation of our company's standards. Among the many creepy details reported by Lauer's colleagues was the fact that he had a button installed at his desk to remotely close and lock the door to his office, which at least two women said Lauer used while alone with them in his office. Far more lurid and damaging stories about Lauer emerged two years later. Vanity Fair reported that a former NBC News assistant had accused Lauer of sexual assault and claimed NBC had covered it up. The assistant said she had repeatedly told her NBC colleagues and superiors about the attack, but that nothing ever came of it. Billy Bush is a junior member of the Bush dynasty, cousin to a governor and a president, and nephew to another president. But this Bush pursued a career outside of politics and has been a successful radio and television personality for over 20 years. That all came crashing down, however, when, during his time on Access Hollywood, Bush had a very candid, behind-the-scenes chat with then-TV celebrity Donald Trump. The recording of this meeting went down in political history when it was publicly revealed 10 years later in the run-up to the 2016 presidential election. By 2016, Bush had joined NBC's Today Show, and Donald Trump had become the Republican candidate for president. Just a month before Election Day, barely a year after Bush had joined Today, the audio of Bush and Trump's conversation was leaked to the media. In the recording, Bush can be heard laughing as Trump explains how his fame allows him to freely grope and harass women. NBC fired Bush before the end of the weekend. He later told CBS, It was leaked on a Friday, and then Sunday morning I walked to go back to work, and the driver said, I'm sorry, they've canceled the car. I called my lawyer and I said, Uh, we okay? And he said, Nope. Bush now works at Extra, an entertainment news show, where he uses his experience of getting fired to secure interviews with celebrities who have likewise experienced public scrutiny. For many decades, Harvey Weinstein was one of the most powerful people in Hollywood. Just a few years ago, however, he became the principal villain of the Me Too movement after being accused and convicted of multiple sex crimes. Journalist Ronan Farrow's expose on Weinstein did more than reveal Weinstein's atrocious conduct, however. It also revealed the pernicious influence he had in the media. According to Farrow, Weinstein's behavior was an open secret. At the time, he wrote, Weinstein and his associates used non-disclosure agreements, payoffs, and legal threats to suppress victims' accounts. Furthermore, Farrow alleged that NBC had been covering up for Matt Lauer for years that Weinstein knew about it and that he had used blackmail to dissuade NBC from reporting on his own crimes. Entertainment journalist Paula Froelich later told WNYC that she personally witnessed an example of Weinstein's corrupting status in the media in 2000 when he assaulted a journalist at a party in front of other journalists and nobody reported on it. She said, People don't want to report on the table, they want a seat at it. Brian Williams is an old-school newsman. He started reporting almost immediately after dropping out of college before joining NBC News in 1993, where he would stay for the rest of his career. He rose to become anchor of the network's premier news program, NBC Nightly News, in 2004, garnering several excellence in broadcasting awards over the following decade. Nightly News brought in an average of 9 million to 10 million viewers a night, and Williams was one of the highest paid people in news. Over time, however, a number of Iraq war veterans began publicly questioning a story that Williams liked to tell about being shot at in a helicopter. Two of our four helicopters were hit by ground fire, including the one I was in. No kidding. Uh, RPG and, and AK-47. He was also accused of inventing stories about his experiences in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina. Before long, other outlets had begun examining Williams' reporting, and NBC quickly launched an investigation. In a memo to NBC personnel explaining why he was being suspended and demoted, NBC News president Deborah Turnus said, Brian misrepresented events which occurred while he was covering the Iraq war. After a six-month suspension, Williams returned to the air as an anchor on MSNBC, where his $10 million annual salary remains intact. Despite billions of dollars invested in advertising and infrastructure, hundreds of millions of people watching, and tens of thousands of spectators in the stands, 
The 1996 Atlanta Olympics has become known for only one thing, death. 29-year-old Eric Robert Rudolph, enraptured by hateful right-wing propaganda, planted a series of bombs at the Olympic venues. One person was killed in the blasts, and over 100 more were injured. Richard Jewell was a former cop and security guard at the Olympics. He alerted authorities to a suspicious package stuffed beneath some bleachers. A bomb squad was called in and the area evacuated right before the device exploded. At the 10th anniversary of the Atlanta Olympics, the Georgia governor honored Jewel for his heroism on the night of the bombing. Before his bravery was recognized, however, Jewel was subject to an intense media spectacle that painted him as the terrorist. In the wake of multiple media reports suggesting he was involved with the plot, Jewel sued the Atlanta Journal-Constitution Tom Brokaw and NBC News, CNN, The New York Post, and Time Magazine. Some of Jewel's lawsuits were thrown out, but NBC was among those who settled, reportedly paying him over $500,000, far more than the nuisance value that is usually offered to potential plaintiffs. One of America's big three news anchors for two decades, legendary broadcaster Tom Brokaw started out with NBC in 1966 and only announced his retirement in January 2021. He's penned several best-selling books over the years and has received numerous awards in journalism. Brokaw was also the only anchor to have helmed all three of NBC News' flagship programs, Today, Nightly News, and Meet the Press. In 2014, Brokaw was even awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor a president can bestow on a civilian by President Obama. But five years later, he stoked up a damaging controversy for his network when he was made to apologize for telling Latinos to learn English. During a live panel discussion on NBC's Meet the Press regarding then-President Trump's proposed border wall in 2019, Brokaw repeated a number of racist sentiments from people he had spoken with. Brokaw went on to argue, I also happen to believe that the Hispanics should work harder at assimilation. That's one of the things I've been saying for a long time. The online backlash was swift, and NBC's social media was flooded with angry excoriations of Brokaw's statement as ignorant at best, if not outright xenophobic. Brokaw later took to Twitter himself to say, I am sorry, truly sorry my comments were offensive to many. The great enduring American tradition of diversity is to be celebrated and cherished. In 2012, the 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was shot and killed by George Zimmerman. Prior to the shooting, Zimmerman had been following Martin and even called 911 to report Martin as suspicious. In their coverage of the events, NBC aired what many people called an edited, out-of-context cut of that 911 call. During their broadcast, Zimmerman is heard saying, "I looks like he's up to no good. He looks black. What NBC's viewers didn't hear, however, was that Zimmerman's assertion that Martin was black had actually been made in response to the 911 dispatcher asking. Okay, and this guy, is he white, black, or Hispanic? He looks black. After the segment aired, NBC publicly apologized to Zimmerman, saying that, it became evident that there was an error made in the production process that we deeply regret. NBC fired at least three journalists involved in allowing the edited call to air. Zimmerman then sued NBC for defamation, alleging that NBC's editing made him appear to be a racist, which exposed him to public ridicule and led to his own emotional distress. Two years after Martin was killed, a judge threw out Zimmerman's lawsuit. The court ruled that, since he had pursued a course of conduct that ultimately led to Martin's death, Zimmerman had become a public figure. As such, he needed to prove that the network had acted with malicious intent, which is the standard required to prevail in a libel suit involving a public figure. The sitcom 30 Rock was an award-winning, long-running star of NBC's primetime lineup. Running for seven seasons, 30 Rock was a satirical take on the experiences of the show's star, writer and producer Tina Fey, as head writer for another NBC property, Saturday Night Live. The crew of 30 Rock was dotted with SNL alumni, from the writing staff to the producers, but most notably by Faye's fellow star comedian, Tracy Morgan. Although Morgan only played a supporting role on the series, he frequently stole the show and quickly became a fan favorite. Unfortunately, he was just as prone to making the wrong kind of headlines as his character. 
I'm saying the Disneyfication of New York is over, everyone. At the stroke of midnight, your Lexus is going to turn back into a hot pile of rats fighting over a human finger. Morgan got his start as a stand-up comedian and never stopped performing live, even while filming 30 Rock. At a 2011 comedy show in Nashville, Morgan made a joke that was widely criticized as homophobic, and NBC was quick to distance themselves from their star's comments. One NBC executive said at the time, Tracy's comments reflect negatively on both 30 Rock and NBC, two very all-inclusive and diverse organizations, and we have made it clear to him that this kind of behavior will not be tolerated. Morgan apologized as well, and Faye publicly said she hoped his apology would be accepted. However, she also added, Stand-up comics may have the right to work out their material in its ugliest and rawest form in front of an audience, but the violent imagery of Tracy's rant was disturbing to me. Seinfeld was a juggernaut in sitcom history. Over its nine seasons, the infamous show about nothing was nominated for 186 different awards, winning 74, including 27 Emmys. And the show has staying power, too. When Hulu had exclusive rights to Seinfeld, the average age of their viewers was just 27 years old, someone who would have been in the second grade when Seinfeld's finale first aired. The show has since moved to Netflix, as part of a deal for which Jerry Seinfeld was paid over $100 million. Vulture has even calculated the worth of the Seinfeld financial empire as over $3 billion since it first entered syndication. And although the show's various cast members have stirred up their fair share of controversies over the years, Seinfeld itself was actually relatively scandal-free. There is, however, one outlier. The episode in which Kramer burns a Puerto Rican flag by accident. At the time, the president of the National Puerto Rican Coalition said, It is unacceptable that the Puerto Rican flag be used by Seinfeld as a stage prop under any circumstances. The Puerto Rican Day story sparked such outrage that everyone involved officially apologized, even though many of the show's cast and crew insisted that the episode wasn't offensive at all. NBC clearly disagreed, however, and pulled the episode from syndication for four years. Getting a peek behind the veil of some of pop culture's most fascinating circles is always intriguing. But there are some tell-all stories that prove to be so controversial it changes everything we know about the rich and famous. Here are a few tell-all books that were so scandalous that they completely altered the way people thought about their subjects. Confessions of a Video Vixen Anyone who lived through the 90s knows how big the hip-hop scene was. It wasn't just about the music, it was also about the lifestyle. The world couldn't get enough. And when dancer Corinne Superhead Steffens wrote her behind-the-scenes tell-all, the world couldn't get enough of that either. But Confessions of a Video Vixen wasn't entirely what people were expecting. Sure, there were all kinds of juicy bits involving some of hip-hop's biggest names, including Jay-Z and Dr. Dre, but it went to some dark places, too. Her book, and her follow-up books, have focused not on the R-rated fun, but on the industry's abusive atmosphere. When she talked to the Huffington Post in 2015, she said the cycle of abuse in her life started in her childhood and spiraled out of control. She talked openly about self-harm, the cult of celebrity, manipulation, coercion, and what she learned about relationships. That revelation branded her one of the most controversial authors on the New York Times bestseller list, but Steffens has no regrets. Diana, her true story in her own words. The British are obsessed with their royals, but there was something about Princess Diana that captured the attentions of the entire world. The book Diana, her true story in her own words, promised a lot in its title, and it delivered. Author Andrew Morton knew Diana but did his research in secret. They used an intermediary who asked her questions, then passed her recorded responses on to Morton. Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. <laughs> When the book hit the shelves, it wasn't glamorous. It was a story of loneliness, thoughts of self-harm, and a woman heartbroken over her husband's affair. There was paranoia, too, and Morton wrote that Diana was constantly worried about the men in gray, shady figures linked to British security agencies. At first, it was assumed the source of these personal details was various friends, family, and other insiders. It was only after Diana's tragic death that Morton decided to reissue the book, along with transcripts of the tapes she'd sent him, which shocked the world again. Morton had been called a liar of the worst kind, been vilified and resented, and subjected to some serious hate. It wasn't until the tapes came out that everyone realized that these really were her own heartbreaking words. Going Clear 
Scientologists are free to be as weird as they want to, since they fall under religious freedom protections. But in 2013, Lawrence Wright kicked open the doors and published Going Clear, a tell-all book about the organization that went on to be adapted into an HBO documentary. He hit on everything from the group's billion-year contracts and the fundamental writings of L. Ron Hubbard to David Miscavige's continuing work. The book's influence meant all kinds of fingers were being pointed at Tom Cruise and John Travolta, because, as Scientology figureheads, their silence about the abuses coming to light was unacceptable. If I was to join your cult, would I get... We are not a cult. We are a church. Same thing. Cruz and Travolta didn't immediately jump ship, of course, but going clear did help lead the way in exposing every oddity going on behind closed doors in Scientology. Then, Leia Remini piled on with her own tell-all series, further exposing Scientology for its shady practices. If I Did It – Confessions of the Killer If you want to talk about an ill-advised tell-all, look no further than O.J. Simpson's If I Did It – Confessions of the Killer. Cancelled in 2006 and finally published in 2007, the book was met with national furor, more than a decade after Simpson's acquittal for the brutal slayings of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. It described exactly what you'd expect from the title, if he'd done it, this was why, and what happened. The book describes a nightmarish relationship and cast O.J. Simpson as the victim. He even wrote how, when an imaginary friend named Charlie spilled the beans about a hard partying Nicole, Simpson gloved up and went over to the house with only one thing on his mind. Is it any wonder that this one was one of the most controversial, scandalous books to hit the shelves in the 2000s? Reviewers largely agreed that there was essentially no way someone could walk away from this one thinking he was innocent. And even if he was, why revisit such a macabre incident at all? What's the point? Perhaps he just wanted to be back in the spotlight again. LaToya, growing up in the Jackson family. The Jackson family has always fascinated the public, from the earliest days of the Jackson Five. But it wasn't until LaToya Jackson released LaToya, Growing Up in the Jackson Family, that the world realized the full extent of the damage done by success and a father who relentlessly drove his children in the direction he wanted them to go. In the book, she writes about how abusive he was, physically and emotionally. She told the Chicago Tribune that her parents' refusal to meet with her and her siblings and discuss what happened ultimately pushed her to write the book as her way of moving on and starting to repair the damage that was done. I wish that my heart could speak to your heart, if hearts could speak to each other without us verbally speaking. Since the shocking allegations in the first book, she's written several more, including Starting Over. That one shocked, too, as she detailed her escape from one abusive situation and her involvement in another with manager and ex-husband Jack Gordon. Before these stories were released, it might have seemed like a turn of fortune to grow up Jackson, but now the world knows otherwise. Netflix has come a long way in the last decade or so, from its humble beginnings as a DVD rental service all the way to the streaming behemoth it is today. But that doesn't mean the company has been completely free of controversy. Here are some of the biggest scandals to have hit Netflix to date. There are some things you just don't do on television, no matter what kind of network you are. And one of those things is displaying nudity by underaged actors. Netflix's Girl is a Golden Globe nominee, but critics have attacked it for crossing a few serious red lines. The film follows a transgender girl named Lara who is bullied at school and struggles to succeed as a ballerina. It's a tragic and quite horrible story, and if you've got a weak stomach, or even just a heightened sense of empathy, you may want to give Girl a pass. The scene that raised the most eyebrows was the one that included a full frontal shot of the 15-year-old actor who portrays Lara. Even Netflix's own censors thought the scene was just too much. According to Decider, the Netflix version of the film was supposed to air without the scene in question, but the film's director complained and it was eventually left in. But was that really a victory for art, or was it unnecessarily gratuitous? Either way, the end result was a scene which proved hugely uncomfortable. Kevin Spacey was delightfully nasty as House of Cards' Frank Underwood, and fans really did love watching him spearhead the show's fictionalized implosion of Washington politics. Then, however, the truth came out about him, and now nobody cares about Frank Underwood anymore. Kevin Spacey was fired by Netflix because of a sexual misconduct scandal, which ended up costing the service close to $39 million. And the butchery begins. According to Reuters, the figure was related to unreleased content which Netflix decided not to move forward with. 
Netflix's decision to fire Spacey wasn't an unsurprising move, considering, as of early 2018, the actor had more than 30 accusers, including eight who had actually worked on House of Cards. And it probably didn't help that, according to those accusations, the advances he made on the show's crew were some of the most reprehensible of all. In this case, Netflix certainly did the right thing by letting Spacey go, regardless of how much it ended up costing them. It's usually considered pretty bad form to use real disaster footage in your fictional movies and television shows, but that didn't stop Netflix from doing just that during the making of their 2018 horror thriller Bird Box. Yes, you could argue that using old footage would save studios a lot of time and money they'd otherwise have to spend either recreating a disaster on set or with CGI. On the other hand, anyone who has lost loved ones in a disaster shouldn't have to be surprised when footage of their loved ones' final moments shows up in a popular Netflix film. And this wasn't some hundred-year-old disaster that has long passed out of living memory either. This was the 2013 Lac Megantique rail crash in Quebec, which claimed 47 lives. According to the BBC, Netflix used a clip from the disaster to illustrate the early apocalyptic scenes in the film after people began to be affected by the invisible monsters. Granted, the clip came from a stock footage company, so there's certainly a possibility that Netflix wasn't entirely aware of its origins. On the other hand, it's not like they were especially quick to remove it after the truth came out. In fact, early complaints were met with the corporate equivalent of a half-hearted shrug, and it was only after Canadian officials sent Netflix a highly critical open letter that the service decided they'd better replace it with different stock footage. It's not really clear why, in recent years, Netflix have apparently attempted to hire Fox employees specifically. Whatever the reason, The Hollywood Reporter says Fox wasn't exactly happy that Netflix was poaching its employees. In a lawsuit against the streaming giant, Fox complained, Netflix ran a brazen campaign to unlawfully target, recruit, and poach valuable Fox executives by illegally inducing them to break their employment contracts with Fox to work at Netflix. Fox claimed Netflix even tried to recruit two higher-level employees, a programming executive and a marketing executive, despite knowing they had contracts with Fox. The lawsuit is still pending as of May 2019, but Viacom has also come forward with a poaching accusation against Netflix. It claimed Netflix had also poached one of its contracted employees. Netflix isn't taking this all lying down, though. The company has said that Fox basically bullied its employees into taking unfair deals, which gave it the right to step in and offer another way out. Fox, on the other hand, accused Netflix of possessing, quote, an actual poaching blueprint, which lists the names of executives and the time remaining on their contracts. The college admission scandal of 2019 was a profound example of just how much division there is between the haves and the have-nots of the world. Thanks to Lori Loughlin and Felicity Huffman, as well as a bunch of other super-rich people, people are now very much aware that all you need to get into a respected university is money. Lots and lots of money. You think your spending has gotten out of control? Give me an example! When Huffman's name came up as one of roughly 50 individuals who bought their kids' way into prestigious universities, the media and public reacted with fury. And when that happened, Netflix jumped into action. According to Business Insider, Huffman was set to appear in a film called Otherhood, which was due to be released just a couple of weeks after Huffman pleaded guilty to her charges related to the scandal. The film never showed up on the streaming service, and as of May 2019, the film still wasn't listed among Netflix's offerings. Netflix gave the punt to Lori Loughlin, too, who was also implicated in the college entrance scandal and was a four-season guest star on the series Fuller House. A production source told TMZ that there are currently no plans for her to return to the fifth season, which is really just a polite way of saying they've washed their hands of the whole affair. Although Netflix's DVD rental service isn't really their focus anymore, back when that was the company's main gig, they were accused of throttling people who were too comfortable with their unlimited accounts. In those days, if you had the three DVDs a week plan but returned your movies too quickly, you got flagged as a heavy user. In order to keep those heavy user accounts profitable for the service, Netflix would delay shipments so those customers weren't receiving as many titles. In other words, unlimited didn't really mean unlimited at all. But when enough people make false promises, words stop meaning anything. But Netflix has been accused of a different kind of throttling on the streaming side, too. According to the Competitive Enterprise Institute, the company has been throttling certain customers for years, notably those who are using the AT&T or Verizon wireless networks. 
The company says it caps video streams on AT&T and Verizon at 600 kilobytes per second, but has no such limitations against people using Sprint or T-Mobile because those services don't charge fees to customers that go over on their data allowance. On the company's blog, Netflix said it believes restrictive data caps are bad for consumers and the internet in general. Basically, it's not their fault. Although Netflix's movie library isn't quite up to scratch these days, most people love the service because it still produces some great commercial-free television, for a relatively small subscription fee. But what if they took the whole commercial-free thing out of the equation? Imagine not only having to wait for your show to buffer, but also having to sit through long series of endless commercials. Understandably, it's not an attractive prospect. So in 2015, when people heard Netflix was going to add commercials to its content, the reaction was a little less than positive. According to The Motley Fool, the rumor took root when Netflix began running trailers at the end of shows and movies, meaning after you finished streaming something, you'd see a trailer for a Netflix original series. Evidently, there were lots of people who thought this was gateway advertising, and Netflix was just preparing everyone for what would be an eventual onslaught of commercials. Netflix was eventually forced to release a statement to reassure customers that it wasn't going to happen. CEO Reed Hastings posted on Facebook, No advertising coming onto Netflix. Period. Just adding relevant cool trailers for other Netflix content you are likely to love. Today, being grandfathered at Netflix usually refers to an old account that maintains its original perks, while all the rest of the people who didn't jump on the bandwagon 10 years ago have to pay more money for less. According to Variety, in 2016, Netflix user George Karatsitz filed a proposed class action lawsuit against Netflix, accusing the company of raising the price on his grandfathered account. Karatsitz said Netflix promised his account would be $7.99 per month every month, pretty much forever, which it was right up until the point which it became $9.99 a month. The progress of the lawsuit is unclear. The story dropped out of the news almost as quickly as it arrived, and there doesn't seem to have been a whisper about it since. A certain amount of embellishment of reality has to happen with just about every television show. Sometimes, of course, that's okay. After all, reality is pretty boring. But sometimes it's offensive and insulting, and the people who make the shows don't seem to know the difference. One example of this happening is Netflix's sitcom Atypical, which Quartz says it's supposed to be a sensitive look at the problems autistic people face in the dating scene. Unfortunately, critics say the show just paints autistic men as stereotypically nerdy and kind of sexist. Because the protagonist of Atypical is autistic, he has trouble understanding social cues, which means he's constantly misinterpreting the signals coming from everyone, especially the opposite sex. And because he's autistic, the audience is supposed to excuse the awful things he does as a result of those misinterpretations which even goes as far as physical abuse. Sure, Atypical is a sitcom, and those kinds of shows aren't exactly renowned for their nuanced understanding of mental health issues, but it's 2019 now, and this kind of thing is better off left in the past. When 13 Reasons Why debuted in 2017, it was hit with immediate criticism, largely because it's more than just the story of family and friends having to deal with the consequences of a loved one's death. According to critics, it also offers a romanticized depiction of suicide. The story begins with the death of Hannah Baker, who has left a set of recordings behind to let everyone in her life know just why she did what she did. And while adults with happy and stable lives may be able to watch a series like this from a detached perspective, this probably isn't good viewing material for anyone who is undergoing challenges of their own and may even be contemplating suicide. According to Rolling Stone, 13 Reasons Why makes suicide seem like the easy way out, and because Hannah Baker continues to exist in flashbacks, it kind of makes that act seem less final, too. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK, 1-800-273-8255. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.